Hello, and welcome to Williams Mullins Benefits Companion, a podcast that helps employers navigate the complex legal challenges of managing their employee benefit plans. I'm your host, Bryden DeWitt, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Mark Currenton, Chair of Williams Mullins Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Practice Group here in our Richmond office. Welcome back to the Benefits Companion, Mark. Thanks, Bryden. I'm happy to be here. Uh, Today, we're going to be discussing some of the recent developments in the fiduciary duty litigation involving 401k and 43b plans. Since, Mark, since 2020, there have been nearly 200 uh, cases filed alleging breaches of ERISA fiduciary duty with respect to 401k plans. Over 50 of them have at least partially settled. And it's really, it's been this, this wave of litigation. And I understand the Supreme Court has recently weighed in 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 one of these cases. Well, yes, they have. Earlier this year, in in January, the Supreme Court came down with a ruling in Hughes v. Northwestern University. And that case had been perking up through the lower courts for a couple of years. And it's part of a string of cases brought against public universities, private universities, and other large nonprofits that had 403B plans. And there had been a motion to dismiss in the lower court, and then the Seventh Circuit affirmed the motion to dismiss, and the Supreme Court reversed that. So we'll get to that point, but it had made its way up to the Supreme Court, and it is an important ruling, and it dovetails off a prior ruling from for Tibble, which was a Supreme Court ruling also involving the fiduciary's duty to monitor investments. So Mark... Northwestern University and all these universities, it's, I guess it's easy to see why they were targets of this litigation with four 3B plans that have many investment options and significant plan assets. That's right. All of the initial group that were sued, there were seven sued within a week, I think. And then by two weeks, maybe there were 12, but there was a lot of immediate interest in these cases. And all of the plans Four or 3B plans had significant assets in excess of a billion dollars, sometimes in excess of $2 billion. And so these became high profile cases right away. And the allegations all centered around the duty of prudence that the fiduciaries of the plan had failed to uh, act prudently with respect to the investments and retention of the record keepers and the fees that were charged, et cetera. And so in this Hughes case, in this Northwestern Hughes v. Northwestern University, the current and former employees made several allegations under ERISA and said that the fiduciaries had failed to monitor and control record-keeping fees. They were offering what are known as retail share class funds that charged higher fees instead of the identical institutional share class funds of the same investment. And then an allegation that they offered too many investment options. And in in the situation with Northwestern University, they had over 400 investment options in the plan, resulting in participant confusion and poor investment decisions. So those were pretty important allegations, but the lower courts had ruled against the plaintiffs and said the district court, as well as the Seventh Circuit, had said that they could dismiss the claim about the investments because though there were some lower cost funds, there were some that had institutional share class and lower expense ratios. There were also some that had higher fees, but the Seventh Circuit said, so long as there were some low cost options, the plaintiffs had what they say they want. And therefore the fact that the plan had other options did not make those other more expensive options imprudent. Right. So I guess it's kind of a no harm, no foul view of it that you have 400 options. It's a participant directed plan. Participants, you had the ability to select the funds that you think were acceptable, or you could have selected the ones you think are unacceptable. But it was really, I guess, the argument that it was the the decision was in the participants' hands. And so, again, no harm, no foul. Right. That's the thinking. Right. And that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you can see how from the fiduciary perspective, well, we've we've got 400 options. So, you know, some of them are, are just exactly what you want, and some may not be what you want, but someone else might want it. Right. So did the Supreme Court go along with that thinking? No, they did not. And, oh. and, and there's the rub, because the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, eight to zero, uh, Justice Barrett did not 
take part in this this decision because was not present on the court at the time of the oral arguments. But uh, the decision was by Justice Sotomayor, and she wrote that the Seventh Circuit decision was flawed. Its categorical rule that some investment options were prudent was inconsistent with the context-specific inquiry that ERISA requires and fails to take into account Northwestern's duty to monitor all investments and remove imprudent ones. And they hammer this point over and over again in six short pages. It's a short decision, but the point that the court is looking at is it goes back to this Tibble case, which said that all fiduciaries have an ongoing duty of prudence to continue to monitor the investments if they're responsible for investments and to remove imprudent ones when they exist. And so just because it was prudent 10 years ago doesn't mean it's still prudent now. So you have to continually go back and review your investments and make sure that they are providing the rate of return that you anticipate that's reasonable for the market and your benchmarks, as well as the fees are reasonable given the status of the plan. So plan fiduciaries are responsible for all the investment options that are offered under the plan. And although I guess it's not a per se ERISA violation to have hundreds of investment options, but it seems almost impossible to comply if a plan fiduciary is responsible for every single investment option, if you have 400 investment options. Right. Well, it's hard to make that argument that you thoroughly reviewed all of the investment options and that you took the time to understand and meet the ERISA prudent expert standard that someone who is very familiar with this sort of activity and use the same care, skill, and prudence of that type of person and would, in fact, maintain these investments. It's kind of hard to know. I mean, if if you were a full-time ERISA fiduciary, probably yes, 400 is not out of the norm, but 400 for an investment committee, if they're responsible for monitoring and selecting the investments, could seem beyond the scope of what they could actually do. If they've hired an investment manager, that's their full-time job. And so I I don't know that that argument still holds in that situation. And I'm not saying that it's the Supreme Court did not rule 400 is too many. They didn't actually address that issue. They just said, no matter how many you have, if you have 30 or three, the minimum allowed for ERISA 4043 plans, The diversification duty is still there, but access ones, no matter how many you have, you still have to monitor those and remove imprudent ones. So what do you think are some takeaways for planned fiduciaries following the Northwestern Hughes versus Northwestern? Well, I would give it some serious thought. I would think long and hard about, you know, what is the Supreme Court saying? Because this whole context-specific analysis that they're throwing out there also creates plenty of opportunities for people to second-guess their fiduciary decisions. And as a result of that, they can get drug into court by people who want to challenge a particular investment option. And it would not be easy to dismiss a claim of imprudent investment option out of hand. You'd have to get beyond the dismissal stage and get into actual discovery to determine whether or not the facts support the idea that that investment option is in fact prudent. So I think investment fiduciaries do have to act prudently. They have to pay attention to what their role is to make sure that they have documented their decisions as they've looked at the investments and monitored the investments, make sure that their minutes are approved, make sure that they are maintained. You don't just throw them in a, in a folder and lose them. You've, you've got to be able to produce them if anybody ever challenges you on this and says, why did you maintain this? Well, here are our minutes. Here are the reports from the investment advisor or, or the due diligence that we did ourselves supporting that these are prudent investments. But I think fiduciaries need to consider the risk of having their decisions challenged in light of this decision. Okay, well, that'll wrap up our discussion. Thank you, Mark, so much for joining us on the Benefits Companion once again. If listeners have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please contact me. You can also visit our employee benefits page at williamsmullen.com slash employee benefits. There you can find out more about our team as well as past episodes of this podcast and legal alerts. And finally, be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when our next episode posts. Thanks for listening.